Hi, Chris Potts here. This is the fourth in our series of screencasts on quantifier properties. The first screencast set the stage and connected our theory with Keenan's. And the second was focused on context dependence and lexical uncertainty. And the third reviewed a diverse case study for the determiner most. With this screencast, we're going to return to the Keenan article, in particular to the properties of determiners that Keenan identifies and explores. We won't have time for all the properties from the article, so we'll focus on three that seem interesting and important intersectivity, conservativity, and monotonicity. In each case, what we want to do is first understand what the property is at a technical level, and then we want to figure out how to articulate why the property might be important for understanding language and cognition. So let's begin with intersectivity. It's the simplest of the three properties we'll look at. And one brief note about terminology. This is different from the property of adjectives that Part T called intersective. You'll likely see why the same basic term is getting used in both these contexts, but it's probably best to simply view them as separate concepts for now. The definition of intersectivity is given in 33 here. We say that a determiner D is intersective if and only if D A of B is the same as D B of A for all set arguments A and B. So the key idea here is reversibility. For the intersective determiners, we can reverse the arguments without changing the truth conditions. Let's start with sum as an example, and this one is intersective. If sum is intersective, we would expect the sentences some child skateboards and some skateboarder is a child to be truth conditionally identical. And for thinking about these properties, it'll be useful to break that notion down into two-way entailment. So some child skateboards entails some skateboarder is a child, and the reverse holds too. Some skateboarder is a child entails some child skateboards. Only where the entailments go in both directions can we say that we have the equality demanded by intersectivity. And then we can look to our theory to understand why sum is intersective. So the meaning we gave is defined around the set theoretic relation of intersection. And that property is entirely reversible. A intersect B equals B intersect A for all sets A and B. And since sum depends only on this intersection, we can see right away that sum is predicted to be intersective too. Okay, good. Let's contrast that with what we get for every. You might already have the intuition that every will not be intersective because it's built around the relation of subset, and subset is not reversible. But let's again start with some sentences. If every were intersective, then we would have that every child skateboards entails every skateboarder is a child and the reverse. But that's clearly not correct. Just imagine that the set of children is properly contained in the set of skateboarders. That makes every child skateboards true, but then there would be some skateboarders that were not children, and that would therefore counter-exemplify every skateboarder is a child. So we have a failure of entailment. And we could run the argument in the reverse direction, and we would get the same lack of entailment, but recall we only need a failure of one direction to get a failure of equality and therefore diagnose this thing as not intersective. We can see clearly why every is not intersective too when we look to our theory. As I said, it's built around the subset relation. So we're thinking about situations that are schematically like this one here with A properly contained in B. And in such situations, we have A subset B but not B subset A, so no reversibility. The only case where we have reversibility is where A and B are the same set but our definition requires that reversibility hold for all A and B. So one case where it holds isn't enough, and even one counterexample shows that the intersectivity property doesn't obtain. At this point, I hope you can see how things would go for no and at most four. Uh, for no, the correlation is still just based in intersections, so it'll be reversible. And that's matched by our intuitions too, I'd say, right? No child is a skateboarder does seem truth conditionally identical, to no skateboarder is a child. And for at most four, the correlation is dependent only on the cardinality of the intersection, and so obviously that'll be reversible, and that would be matched by our intuitions too, I believe. So that's intersectivity. Some determiners have it, and some don't, and we can see why things pattern the way they do if we look through the lens of our theory. And on the processing side, we might expect intersective determiners to be simpler intuitively, and thus perhaps easier for people to process and maybe verify the truth conditions.
Let's move now to conservativity. Uh, this one will play out differently from intersectivity because we actually have a proposed universal of language. That is that all lexical determiners in all languages are conservative. Now, conservativity is a little more abstract and hard to think about, and it leads us to formulate some unusual sentences, but I'm still confident that we can get our heads around it. The formal definition we'll use is given in 38. We say that a determiner D is conservative if and only if DAB is equal to DA A intersect B. In other words, we can change the scope argument B, the second argument, to the intersection of B with its restriction argument A, and we don't change the truth conditions at all. For illustrations, let's begin with some. I, I guess you can already tell that some will be conservative since it's a lexical determiner, but let's go through the steps. So first we can create two sentences. Some students are skateboarders and some students are students and skateboarders. And the second one is of course not very natural. It feels redundant. But we can see through that and I think see that these two sentences each entail the other. And actually the redundancy I believe is coming from the conservativity of the meaning. Now in terms of the formal theory, it's very easy to see why we would predict some to be conservative. We begin with A intersect B, that's the left side here. And then we're checking out what becomes in the end A intersect A intersect B on the right side. And of course, for any set A, we have that A intersect A is just the set A again. So we can simplify the pair on the right down to just A intersect B. And then of course, we can see that they're identical. Good, let's move to every. It'll be the same story. Every is conservative, but maybe this is a little less obvious. Uh, we begin by looking at some sentences. So every student skateboards and every student is a student and a skateboarder. These seem clearly to be identical. I mean, suppose every student is a skateboarder was true, but every student is a student and a skateboarder is false. Then we would need to find someone who is a student, but not a student and a skateboarder. We certainly won't be able to do that. And our formal theory again makes this clear. The relation on the left side is A subset B. And on the right side, it's A subset A intersect B. The equivalence of these is actually another law of set theory. For example, if A is contained in B, then A is actually identical to A intersect B. And for the converse, if A is a subset of A intersect B, then of course it's contained within B. It's even contained within the intersection. For no, I think it's easy to see that the argument will play out the same way it does for some, right? We'll eventually be asking whether A intersect B and A intersect A intersect B are identical, and that'll simplify down to an obvious equality. What about most? This is maybe less obvious because of the proportional nature of the quantifier. But certainly most students are skateboarders and most students are students and skateboarders seem equivalent in terms of their truth conditions. For the set theoretic reasoning, our explicit proportion meaning makes conservativity easy to see. The left side is built around a meaning with A intersect B used in the numerator. And the right side is built around A intersect A intersect B in the numerator, which we know just simplifies down to A intersect B. The denominator is the restriction and that's unchanged in both cases. I hope these arguments give you a sense for the nature of the conservativity property. I want to turn now to the question of whether this might be a universal of language, but before doing that, I just want to highlight one snippet from Keenan's discussion. So Keenan calls conservativity cons in all caps, and he says, the apparent triviality of such equivalences, equivalences of the sort we just went through, suggests wrongly that cons is a very weak condition. He continues, K and S, that's a reference to another paper, show that for a domain with cardinality n, the number of conservative functions is 2 to the 3 to the n, whereas the total number of functions from p sub e to gqs is 2 to the 4 to the n. In that last bit, Keenan is just describing all the possible ways we could define determiners. And he continues, thus, in a situation with just two individuals in the domain, there are 65,536 functions that we could call determiner functions, but only 512 of these are conservative. So conservativity rules out most ways we might associate properties with NP denotations. In other words, the conservative determiners are very few in relation to all the conceivable ways we could define determiners. So the fact that our lexical items tend to obey conservativity, and maybe obey it in all cases, is really striking if true.
And indeed, in another foundational paper in the field, Barwise and Cooper proposed this as a universal. They said, every lexical determiner in every language is conservative. Keenan is a tad more circumspect. He says, with at most few exceptions, English debts denote conservative functions. And he has a footnote that unpacks that a bit, where he seems to be alluding to a difference between surface forms and logical forms in a way that we could perhaps connect back to our own discussions of that under the heading of compositionality. But for time, let me skip right to potential counterexample only here to give you a sense for what it might be like to encounter a non-conservative determiner. So consider only dogs bark, and suppose just for now that only is a determiner. We begin with only dogs bark, and we assess whether this is equivalent to only dogs or dogs that bark. Well, in our possible world, only dogs bark is false. You can think of seals as counterexamples. But seals don't counterexemplify only dogs or dogs that bark. Nothing can counterexemplify that sentence since it's a tautology. Of course, only dogs are dogs that bark. It's like only dogs are dogs. So thus we have a failure of entailment going from only dogs are dogs that bark to only dogs bark, right? Only dogs are dogs that bark is true in our world, for example, but only dogs bark is false because of the seals. So if only were a determiner, then you can see that it would be a counterexample to the proposed universal. It seems to be not conservative. And one way to see why things unfold this way is to consider that only might be a sort of reverse of every, right? For every, we say A subset B, where A is the restriction and B is the scope. For only, we could say B subset A in effect. And thus, when we turn to conservativity, we're comparing B subset A with A intersect B subset A. And then it's clear that the right side is always true, whereas the left side is false for many sets A and B. So has our universal proposed here already fallen? I would say it hasn't because only is not a determiner, but rather a very complex sort of adverb or ad nominal modifier. It looks like a determiner in the sentence only dogs bark, but it also appears on verb phrases in sentences like Sandy only eats ice cream and even on prepositional phrases, as in Sandy eats ice cream only in the summer. And we see it also appearing with determiners, as in only some dogs, whereas determiners we've seen do not typically stack up like this, right? You don't get things like every some dog. Only is also highly focus sensitive, so that Sandy only eats ice cream is different from Sandy only eats ice cream. So all these things make it very unlikely that only is a determiner, and thus arguably, our proposed universal is not threatened by only in particular, but there may be other threats out there, of course. A final note that I can't resist. One might be able to make the case that conservativity is a property of natural language determiners because it facilitates a certain kind of processing strategy. If you think about it, conservativity is telling you that you don't need to consider the entire verb phrase. Rather, you can just consider the verb phrase as intersected with a restriction. And that might lead to faster processing strategies and thus make determiners more efficient for people to evaluate than they would be if you had to always check the entirety of the verb phrase meaning uh, and so forth. Okay, on to our final determiner property. This is monotonicity. And this is going to key directly into the inference patterns for determiners that we saw early in the course. We're now going to explain those patterns in effect in terms of monotonicity. Our first definition is upward monotonicity. Keenan calls this increasing, but upward monotonicity is a more common and less ambiguous term, so let's mainly use that instead. We say that a determiner D is upward monotone on its first argument, if and only if D A of B entails D X of B for all sets A, B, and X, where, crucially, A is a subset of X. So what this definition is saying is that we can preserve truth from DAB to DXB provided that X is larger than, that is, a superset of, the original restriction A. It's upward in the sense that we can go up from a small set A to a larger one X while preserving truth. The next definition is exactly parallel, but it targets the second argument. So the only change from 44A is that we're going to look at B and X. So a determiner D is upward monotone on its second argument, if and only if DA of B entails DAX for all AB and X, where crucially here, 
b is a subset of x. So that's the same upward looking thing we saw before, but now concern, concerning b going from b to the superset x. Why do we need separate definitions? It's because, as we'll see, a single determiner can have different monotonicity on its restriction and its scope. So we need to make separate classifications for each. Let's move now to downward monotonicity, or what Keenan calls decreasing. The definition again comes in a pair, one per argument for the determiner. So to start, we say that a deter determiner D is downward monotone on its first argument, if and only if dA of b entails dx of b for all b a, b, and x, where x is a subset of a. So this looks a lot like 44a, except now we preserve truth by shrinking the first argument down to a subset of a. And we get a parallel definition again for the second argument. A determiner d is downward monotone on its second argument, if and only if dA of b entails dAx for all a, b, and x, where x is a subset of b now. In other words, we preserve truth by looking down into subsets of the scope argument B. Finally, not all determiners are monotonic on one or both of their arguments, and thus we define non-monotone in terms of the other two. A determiner D is non-monotone on an argument, if and only if D is neither upward nor downward on that argument. These will be determiners that don't allow us to go up or down in a given argument slot. Any such change can affect truth, and so we don't have any monotonicity. To get a feel for these definitions, let's look at a few examples. So in 47, I've indicated with these up arrows here that sum is upward monotone on both of its arguments. And we actually saw this on the first day of class. You'll recall that some Swedish student danced entails some student danced, but not the reverse. So we can go up from a smaller set Swedish students to a larger set students. And the same goes for the second argument. Some student waltzed entails some student danced, but not the reverse. In other words, we can go up from waltz to dance. With our formal theory, we can now see why this property holds. The core of this will be asserting that the intersection between two sets A and B is non-empty. So suppose that's true. That's the left side of the argument in the entailment claim. Given that that's true, can we replace A with a superset while preserving truth? And the answer is yes. If the larger set X is a superset of A, we can't possibly empty out the intersection, right? And the same is true for the B argument. We can expand that all we want, and it will never empty out the intersection here. So truth will be preserved. Conversely, you can see why downward monotonicity doesn't hold. For downward monotonicity on the first argument A, we need to preserve, preserve truth for all subsets. But it's easy to empty out the intersection in this case. We can just pick this subset of A here. It has no overlap with B, and hence we've changed the truth value from true to false. And of course, the same could be done for the scope argument B. Just pick this subset here, and you've changed the truth value. Let's contrast this with no in 48. This one is downward monotone on both its arguments. We saw this in a way when we noted that no student danced entails no Swedish student danced, and no student danced entails no student waltzed, right? We preserved truth when we restricted the arguments, when we went down into subsets of them. Let's see why these intuitions hold. The core claim here for a no is that A and B have an empty intersection. Given that, we need to check whether going to subsets of A and B will preserve truth. And of course it will, right? Take the A case. If I'm confined to B inside of A, then I can't possibly end up overlapping with B and changing the truth value. And it's the same for the scope argument. No subset of B will end up overlapping with A. Truth will be preserved. And now we can also see why upward monotonicity doesn't hold in either of these arguments. If we could choose any superset of A, then I could just pick one that contained both A and B. Now there would certainly be things in the intersection of A and B, and thus I would have changed the truth value. To wrap this up, let's look at our first mixed case, the case of every. It will turn out that every is downward monotone on its first argument and upward on its second. Recall that every student danced entails every Swedish student danced. That's a downward inference. And recall that every student waltzed entails every student danced. That's an upward inference on the second argument. The semantics begins with A subset B. If A is a subset of B, then of course any subset of A will also be inside B. That's the downward inference. 
and upward clearly doesn't hold for this argument. If I can expand A in any way I want to, then I could expand it outside of B and destroy the subset relation. For the scope argument, the reverse holds. I can expand B to any superset, and of course all those supersets will still contain A. But I can't shrink B arbitrarily because I could shrink it to a set that's a disjoint from A, destroying the subset relation. Good, I'll leave the rest of these as exercises. I think you'll find that at most 10 shows a familiar monotonicity pattern, but exactly three and most will show new patterns involving non-monotone arguments in some cases. Exploring your intuitions for these cases in parallel with some formal reasoning is a great way to get a better feel for these concepts.